Good afternoon. This is Discussions with Authors, part of Books Over Dreams, an online community meant to foster the passion for books by providing a platform for both authors and readers to exchange ideas and discuss their work. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Uh, Jordan Ellenberg. Uh, Jordan is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Mathematics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His writing has appeared in Slate, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, and the Believer. His 2014 book, How Not to Be Wrong, was a New York Times bestseller and was one of Bill Gates' top five summer books. And today he's joining us to discuss his latest book, Shape, The Hidden Geometry of Information, Biology, Strategy, Democracy, and Everything Else. It is a book about the practical aspects of geometry and mathematics written for a general audience. And yes, perhaps the mere word may conjure thoughts of shapes, theorems, and lectures. However, Jordan masterfully demystifies the fundamentals, making it approachable to a reader and uh, to, to a general audience. Geometry escapes the boundaries of scientific abstraction, and it is very much entrenched in the fabric of our reality, governing everything from political discourse, the flight path of, of mosquitoes, the spread of pandemics, artificial intelligence, and even poetry. Uh, geometry is simply a quintessential part of our everyday lives, or as the author explains it, we can't help but being geometric. Um, questions such as how many holes does a straw have, which may appear trivial, become paradoxical when looked through the lens of geometry. Um, this epitomizes math's ability to spark scientific curiosity and to produce some hilariously entertaining Snapchats. Uh, but it also helps us understand its consequential nature and the role it plays in practical issues surrounding politics, the spread of diseases, and the, ra the, 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 race of, uh, the, the, the rise of machine uh, learning algorithms, all of which are governed by the same laws and are subject to uh, exploitation. This is what makes shapes such an important text. It effectively democratizes concepts traditionally relegated to textbooks and classrooms, making this book not just quite an entertaining read, but also highly critical to understand some of the mechanics of the world. A book that we're certain you'll enjoy from cover to cover. So Jordan, thank you so much for joining us today. We're happy to have you with us and cheers. Cheers, wow, thank you for having me on. That book sounds great, where can I get that? Okay, now tell them. <laughs> you made it sound amazing. It certainly is. We loved it. We loved it. So perhaps we wanted to start with this. Um, you've been writing for a general audience for quite some time now, and this book in particular uses examples and analogies as a perfect vehicle to deliver some of the fundamentals around geometry and uh, its practical uses. So it sort of like sparked our interest in understanding a bit more about your overall approach, approach to teaching. In your book, you describe um, Carl Pearson, for example, as the type of educator that would throw a thousand coins and make their students count them to witness firsthand the beauty of the law of large numbers. Uh, what is your approach when educating the public and your students in the classroom? Yeah, and that's actually a really interesting example, this example of, uh, of Carl Pearson throwing 10,000 pennies on the floor and making the students count the heads and tails to sort of see the law of large numbers in action, because that is something which is quite striking and I can imagine some students really being inspired by it and thrilled by it. And I can also imagine other students being like, this sucks. Like, why am I doing this menial thing? Like when we could have proved the formula on the blackboard instead, I'm like on my hands and knees counting pennies, right? So, you know, one thing I have for sure learned about teaching in my many years doing it is that there's no one right way. I used, I spent a lot of time, you know, when I was starting out trying to find like, what's the right way to explain a mathematical topic. Um, and over time, I guess I've come to feel that different students are different and different people are gonna to respond to different things. Some people love a physical demonstration. Other people sort of find that corny, for example. Um, I do think there's some wrong ways, by the way. The fact that there's no single right way doesn't mean there's no wrong ways. But I think in general, I've tried to train myself to kind of mix it up and present things in different ways. Cause that just maximizes the chance that each student at some point is going to be like, okay, now I see what he's saying. I don't know what the hell he was doing for the last 30 minutes. Like, but now, now finally he said something meaningful and whatever I was doing for the last 30 minutes, maybe somebody else was like, this was great. Then he like just went off course and now I'm checking my email because he's like doing something that makes no sense. So, I mean, I think that's a given. I think because students are a very, very group of people, um, there's no one perfect way to do it. I will say though that, I think, 
I always hesitate to generalize, but I think as teachers, we are always storytellers in one way or another. I mean, I think there is a narrative uh, to a mathematical argument. There's a narrative to a mathematical application, like a problem we wanted to solve and we couldn't, and then we develop a technique and then we can, right? That's like the structure of a novel, like in four pieces, like right there. Um, and I, in some sense, grew up as like, you know, as a writer of fiction. I mean, when I learned to write, it was in learning to write prose fiction and write short stories and novels. And that was sort of how I was trained as a writer. So I think, you know, my development as a teacher and my development of a, as a writer have been very much in parallel centered on this kind of feeling of storytelling. You can definitely tell that as we were reading the book, we found that even the topic, I mean, the, the book is, is dense in, its, in the sense that it covers a lot of ground, but it is very approachable in the way that it, pro that, that it touches upon these very different concepts. So certainly, certainly we noticed. And I think, you know, I try to get that same philosophy I have in the classroom of like, let me throw this at you a bunch of different ways in a bunch of different styles because different students are different and different readers are different too. And, you know, in the book, there's times when it's like, let me just sort of tell some story that grabbed me about some human being who was working on math and like their bizarre way of being and living and thinking. Um, and other times I'm like, let's just like do an example where you can take out your pencil and work it out as you go. Those are two very different modes of talking about math, but I try to include those and corny jokes and pictures and like, what, you know, whatever else. And each person, I, I would say every single aspect of the book, I can tell you that there are people who are like, oh, that was the part I really liked. And other people who are like, oh, it was all great except for that. It's just how <laughs> readers are. No, but that was also what I, I enjoyed about the book that I was reading it and I wasn't reading uh a geometric textbook. It was like really listening to you talk, maybe in the classroom or maybe even in a setting like this and uh, saying story, stories and anecdotes. Um, so it was very entertaining. I'm so glad. before I'm we glad. dive into some of specific examples, let's talk about the relevance of geometry in our everyday lives. What do you think are perhaps some uh, real world applications that people would be shocked to find out that are governed by geometry? And uh, what drove you to write this book for those examples? So I think um, I'll say some stuff that's in the book and some stuff that's not in the book. Because by the way, when you write a book, you always like, there's like lots of stuff that you realize, okay, I've hit my deadline and I've also hit like, you know, 400 pages and like they, nobody wants me to write any more of this. The publisher doesn't want me to write any more of this. I don't want to, so, you know, there's always lots of stuff that would be great to write about um, that you couldn't. And actually in this book, I actually, in the acknowledgments, which is supposed to be where you thank everybody who helped you. And I did that. I also acknowledged all the topics that I didn't get to write about. And maybe I'll write about it in another book later, but I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to do that. But, um, you know, certainly two things that are in this book are the guts of machine learning, the guts of the kind of new science of artificial intelligence that we're developing, because I think that it is so often presented as a form of magic or as a form of sort of technology whose principles are so far beyond the ordinary non-practitioners can that it's not even worth talking about. In fact, the kind of conceptual guts of it are not so complicated and are very fundamentally geometric in nature. They represent a way of exploring a space. Um, and so I really wanted to write about that to sort of like, you know, tear the lid off a little bit. Now, of course, the details of the impl implementation, those are incredibly complicated. And I don't write about those because I want to write about the ideas. I want to write about the underlying concepts. Um, th then the other thing, and um, this is, um, again, I'm sure your audience is worldwide, but for an American audience, you know, there is this, uh, there is this issue of the way that our Congress is selected and the way our state legislators are selected, a very hot political issue in the United States, which is actually um, about to get hotter right now because we've just had a census and states are going to sort of release these new legislative maps. Um, it is of all the many, many hot political issues that have occupied people's minds in the United States over the last few decades, it's certainly the one that has the most math in it. Um, it and so a lot of mathematicians have gotten involved in a way that it's very rare. I mean, mathematicians, of course, were people, so we're political, but usually we're political in a way that has nothing to do with our special knowledge and special skills as mathematicians. So this is a rare occasion when mathematicians have really waded into it. And I have colleagues who they're there testifying before the Supreme Courts of various states, like sort of giving a math lecture, like to a group of judges. And, 
you know, I think the stakes are high. If I teach calculus, boy, that's when the stakes are really high, right? You have nine students in front of you and they're going to decide based on what you say. So I really wanted to tell that story because it's something that's been in a lot of newspapers, but you know, in a newspaper, and I've written about it in the newspaper too, but you have a thousand words. There's only so much you can do when there's like a really rich, deep story with a lot of chains that connect. Um, you need a little more space. So those were two. Th so those were two things. But to be honest with you, I mean, I think for a while I knew I was going to write another book. I was like, there's so much stuff I want to talk about. I want to talk about developments in AI. I want to talk about uh, redistricting. Um, I want to talk about. Um, you know, we, we can, we may or may not talk about this, but the kind of the story of the end of human dominance of checkers, which is a story I've been fascinated with for many years. Um, and I was like, in my mind, this makes sense to me. But does it make sense? Like if I go to a, the Penguin Random House and say like, okay, my next book is going to be about checkers, the guts of artificial intelligence and gerrymandering. They're going to be like, what? Like what? <laughs> But I was like, but if it makes sense to me, then there must actually be some theme. It like feels right. And so I had to think for a while about like, what is connecting all these things? Why do these topics make sense together in my mind, besides the fact that I'm interested in all of them? And then I started to see it's this thread of geometry. It's the fact that all of these, and then, and then once I had that, of course, then there was like a million other geometric things I wanted to write about. And then after I started writing, then, you know, you might've heard there was a giant global pandemic. So then suddenly I was like very interested in that and became like an amateur mathematical epidemi epidemiologist, like a quarter of the world's population. And so <laughs> then I had to kind of change gears and because that of course is geometry too. And then I sort of like fell down a huge rabbit hole of learning about the kind of super interesting history of the mathematics and geometry of, um, of studying the spread of pandemics, which is also a, something exploring a space but you know it's a it's a virus exploring the space and the space is us and that way no, certainly, of it has been tremendously productive yeah some amazing topics there certainly but i'm very happy you chose those two topics because i know for a fact that the uh, hyra was very impressed about uh, that chapter talking about the political situation in the u.s and uh, i found very fascinating that chapters about the uh, machine learning and uh, yeah the trees about go and chess and checkers so I'm very happy that you mentioned those two chapters because they were among our favorites. So the book gives us a notion around uh, Abraham Lincoln alluding to his passion for uh, Euclid and his use of geometry, not just in the quantitative sense when he worked out as a surveyor, but also when he laid out arguments and was asked to demonstrate. Beyond any practical applications, can geometry shape the way we think? Or as I think you refer in the book, create a mental discipline? I think so. I mean, it's certainly something, let me put it this way, another sort of cool fact that I learned while researching this part. And by the way, all this stuff about Abraham Lincoln and his love for geometry, that was not in the original proposal. I sort of found out about that while I was writing. So my method, it's, it's probably the wrong method. It's very disorganized, but I think my editors know me by now know, well enough to know that I'm going to send in a proposal and I say, this is what I'm going to write about. But then when I start to research, I find other stuff. And then inevitably, I throw out stuff I was going to say. Because <laughs> if, because if I, I always, I mean, look, I only have one heuristic I can use. Like if I'm totally fascinated by something, I sort of come across something and I'm like, oh my God, I have to sort of spend my entire day. I was supposed to write this today, but instead I'm going to spend my entire day, like sort of like reading like 18th century text and like learning about this. I'm like, if I'm this interested, it must be interesting. You just got to have faith in yourself that like, that if, if yeah, I'm like obsessed with this for today, I can get this on the page and it'll be interesting on the page. So the Abraham Lincoln stuff is a perfect example of that. I had no idea he had any interest. And then, you know, you read about what he said about geometry and what other people said about him doing geometry. And it's very clear that he saw in it something that, oh, he wasn't a trained mathematician. He saw in it something that we see too. Just as you say, this kind of habit of mental discipline, this kind of, um, you know, I would call it integrity. And in a political context, of course, Abraham Lincoln is known as Honest Abe. That's sort of what he's known for. And people think of it in terms of like, uh, well, he didn't like lie to your face, but it, it's not just that. It's something deeper than this. And sort of one of his colleagues, um, again, I found this quote that I found so telling. He said like, he would no more make a dishonest argument to you than he would steal a penny out of your pocket. 
So he saw that as the sort of, he saw making a sort of incomplete or shoddy or shabby argument as essentially the equivalent of committing a crime. And that's, I think, a very geometric way to see things. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. Not so common among politicians in general, yeah, right? Definitely not. And let's talk. Let's talk about then the shadow politics that you that you mentioned earlier, um, and that chapter called "Let's Speak About uh, let, um, How Matt Broke Democracy and It May Still Save It." Uh, the date November 6, two thousand eighteen, a nationwide uh, pro democratic sentiment allowed Democrats to sweep the state of Wisconsin, or so they thought. Um, yes, they they they, they swept the, the statewide offices and, and defeated uh, Scott Walker, um, and then they also picked up some. Um, the attorney general and the treasury position, which were previously held by Republicans. However, the state assembly remained under Republican control, uh, losing, I think you mentioned, merely just one seat. Um, you explained that by stratifying the voting data, you could see or you could tell that most voters chose Democrats, but most of the districts ended up choosing Republicans. And the simple explanation it appears to be gerrymandering and the artificial Republican friendly legislative maps are drawn by Republicans themselves. So can you tell us a little bit about gerrymandering how, and, how, and how politicians have exploited it uh, for political gain and, and how can we use geometry to prove gerrymandering has taken place? And more importantly, can geometry reduce the instances of gerrymandering, ethics aside, of course? Yeah, I mean, so in some sense, I mean, this was a fascinating one for me to write because I thought I knew all about it just from living here and from, you know, organized activities about it. And then like really going in depth, I learned a lot, partly because, you know, as an American, of course, it's like part of the American way to not really know how anything is done in any other country except the United States. So I learned a lot about, you know, all the different things that like, I mean, there's lots of things that go by the name of democracy, right? And like lots of ways of selecting people to make laws of which the American way is only one. Um, but fundamentally, Look, so here's an example, which is not what we would call gerrymandering today, but it shows you that if you get to choose the districts, you have a lot of control uh, above and beyond what the people want for who's seated. Let's say I just decide I have my 20 people who I think should be deciding the laws. Okay, I, I make each of them their own district. I'm like, there's a district of you. And that district is going to, all the people in that district, namely just you, are going to vote for the representative who has to be somebody who lives in that district, like namely you. And then there's a 21st district, which is like the rest of the state. And they'll all vote and pick one person. Okay, if that's the way, if I get to make that choice and I do that, then I have like a 20 to one majority for like anything that I want to do, right? Because I have my well-chosen cabal. Now you might say, well, that's ridiculous. Like obviously you couldn't have like a whole bunch of tiny districts and then like one big district. Well, you know what? You did have that in the United States, like up until the 60s, like up until the Supreme Court kind of stepped in and was like, come on, you can't keep doing that. You can't have like this giant district and they get one and then this tiny district and they get one. And of course in England, the practice was much older. You had these so-called rotten boroughs where there was like um, essentially ghost towns where uh, Edmund Burke wrote about this very comically where like, oh, it seems like their main item of production is members of parliament. Like that's what, <laughs> that's all that's left because somehow they drew these lines in 1290 or whenever and um you know the british people like their tradition so somehow these just sort of stayed in place even when all the people were gone so i think what here's what here's what it's, it's a nice example of math gets more complicated than you think so the supreme court stepped in and said like no you can't do this the districts have, come on the districts have to be the same size and it would be quite reasonable to think well maybe that just solves the problem once maybe once you make them the same size then the person who draws the districts doesn't really matter that much how they're drawn. Uh, the, the, the sort of preponderance of people's political persuasion will be the preponderance in the legislature. Well, it just turns out that's not true. It could be true. It was, it was not an unreasonable guess, but it's just not true. It turns out that by even with the constraint that the districts are the same size, um, you can draw districts in a way that drastically favors your party. And that means that even in a state like Wisconsin, where the two parties have roughly equal numbers of voters, of course, every election is different. People change their minds, people move, people go away. But roughly for the last, gosh, probably 20 years, Wisconsin has been a state that is pretty finely balanced between the two parties. But the people making our laws, that does not show that. Almost two thirds of them are from one party, the Republican Party. And um, 
one thing I want to do, you know, in this section of the book, you know, people like to throw a lot of dust around this and say like, well, maybe it wasn't done on purpose. Maybe there's this reason, maybe there's that reason. And there are cases out there in the world where there's really some ambiguity and they provide some subtlety, like trying to understand what really happened here. Not in Wisconsin, no way. Like in Wisconsin, it is absolutely crystal clear that a certain thing was done in 2010 after the last census in order to draw a map in such a way that no matter how friendly to Democrats Wisconsin voters felt, Democrats simply could not be in a position to hold the majority in the state legislature and make laws. So, I mean, one reason I take some time to do it is because I don't want to do it casually. I want anybody who reads it to be like, okay, anybody who says this is not happening is just BSing. The only reason you would say that is because you were personally invested in not saying it or somebody was paying you to not say it it's interesting because i think that 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 i don't i don't know how necessarily voters how informed they are of these type of uh, situations in their own states and 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 so that's why i think it's such an important aspect of it to highlight it um and and the fact that it is highlighted in your book um you even mentioned to a point that even that, that even drawing, uh, asking algorithms or, or working with algorithms to draw this map may not even necessarily do the job, get the job done. So is there anything in particular that can be done to reduce these type of um, varieties? Well, well, let me make a metaphor because we haven't even gotten to like where the geometry is in this story yet. Um, I said where the politics is. I didn't say where the geometry is. <laughs> um, you know how I said at the beginning of our conversation, okay, there's no single right way to teach but there are wrong ways. There's definitely things you would tell an apprentice teacher. I don't care what you do, but don't do that. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but here's some things I want you to rule out. Don't like insult your students and say they're stupid in the classroom, for instance. There's like no version of good teaching that involves that. Okay, so just as with teaching, so with redistricting, um, as a mathematician, we're a little bit conditioned to be like, okay, let me find the optimal solution to this problem. Let me find, there's some problem, let me find the right way to do it. I think this problem, like so many real world problems where we apply math, um, it's not really like that. If you come to me and say, okay, you have a PhD in math, like what is the ideal way to draw district maps of the state of Wisconsin? I don't think there is an ideal way, but that doesn't mean I don't think there are really bad ways and we're living in one right now. So I think that um, there's a lot of reasons that we are not going to let an algorithm draw the maps for us. Um, there's both mathematical reasons, but also like perfectly good political and legal reasons. I think people in a state want to feel like some human being, ideally somebody who represents them in some way, uh, made this decision and it wasn't like spit out by a computer. I think that it was it, in general, people don't want an algorithm they don't understand or that's unaccountable to use Kathy's word <laughs> to make those choices on their behalf. Um, on the other hand, what we can do is the, the good thing about having algorithms that can generate like tens of thousands of randomly chosen maps is that when the party in power in a state, whether it would be Republicans as it is in Wisconsin or Democrats as it is in Maryland, um, if they say like, hey, look, like this map may look unfair to you, but we didn't do that on purpose. We didn't put our thumb on the scale. It just happens to come out this way. Okay, that's a hypothesis you can test. Because you can say, really, really? Because I made 20,000 random maps and none of them were as favorable to your party as the one that you say just happened to come off the printer that way. So it's a very, very powerful mechanism of just, you know, calling BS on claims that that are, I was well, I was going to say self-evidently BS, but that's the whole point. They're not self-evidently BS. They are the people, but... Um, but it's good to have like a sort of certification that that's the case because that's what enables a judge to say like, come on, come on, this is too much. <laughs> like, you know, we're not gonna say it has to be perfect, but don't do this, go back to the drawing board and do something else. And I, I think that's the, that's the future for us because, you know, let me put it this way. Okay, you work, you guys both work in finance, you understand how incentives work, right? The system we have now it's possible to give yourself such an advantage and ensure your maintained majority with such a degree of robustness. If you're a political operative, if you work for a party, how can you not do that? You'd be doing malpractice to not do it. So we don't have to eliminate gerrymandering. I think that's impossible. But weakening it, that's a very valuable goal. Because I think if you, 
if you say like, okay, look, there's going to be things you can do that are going to give you some advantage. There's no way to sort of purify that and take all advantage to zero. Um, nonetheless, the incentive to do it becomes much less. And I think that opens up political space for getting to actual reforms, which we do see in a lot of states, not in Wisconsin. There's a lot of political reasons for that. But in states like Ohio and Michigan and Utah, and I think Missouri, too. I mean, there are states where the way this process is going to be done this year is actually going to be different in 2021 than it was in 2011. Uh, is it going to be better? Uh, I think so, because look, the advantage of things being really bad is that it's really easy to make them better. Like I feel like the system we have right now is like almost the worst imaginable system. So any kind of disruption you do to it, I'm like, it's probably going to make things better. Interesting. Only one way to go, but up. <laughs> exactly. So let's switch to the topic of the of the pandemic. Um, another chapter of the book that I that, that I uh, that I loved around the spread of pandemics. Um, you wrote, uh, but before that, you wrote an article uh, for the Washington Post a couple of days ago, um, referring to the recent reports from Israel stating that uh, nearly 60% of people hospitalized with severe COVID-19 uh, were fully vaccinated. And while it is important to keep track of the metrics um, around the spread of an increase in hospitalizations, you mentioned that we shouldn't really be overly concerned about the Israeli, um, Israeli um, hospitalization statistics. And you attributed these to something called the Simpsons paradox. Uh, can you explain a little bit about what this is? Yeah, I mean, it's a really fascinating and counterintuitive phenomenon, which is not so much geometry as sort of, in some sense, like simple addition and multiplication. Um, and in the case of like, I'll sort of, I'll give you an example that actually comes from the book that's relevant to this, that I think that um, if you looked and the data I had on this was from, I mean, I wrote this in the book, so it was like last summer. Um, so as of like last July, if you looked at what proportion of people diagnosed with COVID died, you would see that that proportion was higher for white Americans than it was for black Americans. And I think if you have any sense of like how health disparities in America work, that's extremely surprising. Because we know that on the whole, Black Americans are, on the average, not getting as good health care as white Americans. So you're like, why would this be? Why is the disease falling seemingly so much harder on white Americans? The proportion is higher. Um, well, the reason is that the people who really get severe COVID and die are typically pretty old, right? We know that the deaths from COVID-19 are massively, massively concentrated in older people. That's, this, that's absolutely dominates like all other differential factors in uh, whether you get really sick, if you get infected with this disease. And you know, that's the thing about white people, we're old, right? Comparatively speaking, if you look at the median age, um, there are more old white people than there are old black people, old Native American people, old Latino people in the United States. Like that's a basic demographic fact. So if you break that data up and say like, okay, look at black people and white people of a certain age, then you see something much more like what you expect that a higher proportion of cases among black people lead to death than for white people. And yet if you add all those up, all those columns in which the number for black people is higher than the number for white people, you get a total in which the number for white people is higher than the number of black people simply because there are more old white people. And the same thing is happening in Israel right now that they have done a phenomenal job getting those vaccines into the arms of older people in Israel. I think of, I think, um, I mean, it's changed even since I wrote that, they just rolled out these third doses and got them out incredibly fast. So it's changed even since that article went to press like two weeks ago or whenever it was. But certainly more than 90%, even then, and now it's I'm sure higher, of people over 65 in Israel have been vaccinated. So the sort of set of people who are vulnerable in terms of being both old and unvaccinated is really small. And so if you ask yourself, who's going to be hospitalized? Who's that going to be? It's not going to be the 30-year-olds by and large. Not that that number is zero. It's not zero, but it's like pretty small because the number of 70-year-olds who catch COVID and get hospitalized dwarfs the number of 30-year-olds. Um, but given that it's going to be those people, if 95% of them are vaccinated, like, of course, like a lot of hospitalized people are going to get vaccinated because hospitalized people are concentrated among the old and 
the old people are concentrated among the vaccinated. Like, I mean, this, the simplest example would be if you vaccinated everybody over 12, if 100% of those people were vaccinated, then almost all hospitalized people would be vaccinated because there's just not that many babies <laughs> going to the hospital with COVID, right? I mean, it would be almost all adults and those adults would be 100% vaccinated. And if you looked at that and was like, well, I guess the vaccine doesn't work, boy, you'd be making a big boo-boo. Yeah, that's the power of context for sure. <laughs> if you're uh, under the, without the right context, some of these, uh, some of these headlines may, may, may sound completely different. <laughs> but at the same time, I understand why people think that. I mean, that's the thing. I think in, in math, we, once you're used to something, it's easy to forget that it's actually quite subtle. So maybe something that I've developed over my years of teaching and of writing these books is an ability to kind of take myself out of, I already know this mind and into sort of putting my, you know, sort of imagining myself into the world of like the normal person who doesn't spend their whole day thinking about this stuff. Um, Cause if you're going to write about it, that's very important, right? If you just take the attitude of like, you idiots, can you not see like, no, no. I mean, this is terrible, right? This is not teaching. Absolutely. Well, so it is a way of teaching maybe the bad one. <laughs> right exactly yes good point it is it's one of the bad it's one of the bad ways and and overall about the pandemic about pandemic spread and the way that you address it in your book what as you were working on it um what were the personal uh, some of the personal takeaways as you embarked on this process of writing about the spread of pandemics and is the spread of pandemics um, does the spread of pandemic follow a geometric process or is it a geometric process i mean i mean it's at least part a geometric process. You know, the way I would say it, and I say this actually about gerrymandering in the book, like it's, um, you know, it's not math, but it's not not math. It's like, you can't take the math out of it, but that's also not the whole story. Um, certainly I would say for anybody with a mathematical mindset, the process of following the pandemic in real time and trying to understand what was going on with it, and especially uh, trying to understand what was coming next. You know, the old chestnut is, you know, predictions are hard, especially about the future. And this is um, and, and this is very true. Here, I think you know you have a lot of humility because you you cook up some kind of basic mathematical model, and you're like, okay, I think I got a handle on it. Well, I mean, COVID is pretty well confounded. Like every simple model, people have come up with. Um, that said, that doesn't at all mean that we should just give up on studying things mathematically and give up on modeling. What, what I, where I came down. First of all, by the way, boy, it's like a psychological challenge to write about this stuff while it's happening because, you know, I don't know if book publishing is on a sort of a slow cycle. So I had to put this thing to bed in like November 2020, all this stuff about the pandemic. And I'm like, man, I hope this looks okay in May 2021. <laughs> and I think it looks pretty okay. You can tell me what you think. I think, it does, it does. Um, but it's definitely, um, you really don't want to say anything that makes you sound like, <laughs> out of date or like how could he say that and i think there's one thing i think i say in the book like well it doesn't like hang in the air for hours like measles which i think we now think oh no actually it probably does i think what i was writing was like pretty decent in like the fall of 2020 but not so good now um but anyway the metaphor the place where i came down metaphorically was like it's like suppose you're trying to analyze tennis okay so you definitely okay if you throw a tennis ball up in the air and you want to know what's going to happen to it, that is like really easy physics. That's like high school physics, right? You can sort of estimate, if, if you know what level of force you impart to it when you throw it, you can figure out pretty accurately how high it's going to go, when it's going to stop, and where it's going to land. Okay, that's easy. If you try to do, okay, I throw the tennis ball up and I hit it, that's definitely harder physics because you've imparted some force, but now maybe you also you've imparted some spin and you got to take into account air resistance and there's stuff you got to do. But you know, if you do some serious physics, you can model it pretty well and be like, okay, I can look at the way that the ball was struck and predict what's going to happen. Okay. Now you've got two players playing against each other and you're like, predict who's going to win. Okay. That's not physics, <laughs> right? You can't physics your way to the end of a tennis match. On the other hand, the physics is definitely not irrelevant. I mean, those players, damn right. They are sort of implicitly or explicitly sort of thinking about the physics of what's going to happen when they hit the ball in a certain way and try to put it in a certain place. They're not like, oh, it's completely unpredictable. Like what's going to happen when I hit the ball? Like, no, they kind of know that if they hit it a certain way, it's going to travel in a certain three-dimensional path. So where I come, so 
those that physics is definitely not useless. And sort of what I say, what I end up saying is that studying the spread of a pandemic, one reason it's so hard is because it's not just math, it's math plus people's response to math, right? It has that iterative, a thing happens and then a human being reacts to it and then another human being reacts to that thing and so on and so on. So that takes us out of the realm of things that can be like purely predicted by drawing a curve on a piece of paper, but the math is still there. The math is like very much part of it and it's gotta be part of the way we think about it. Even, even now, even having seen so much go by, there's still like a ton of questions about what comes next. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's talk about um, algorithms. And um, back in July, we spoke with Kathy O'Neill, um, who I believe was uh, recently on a virtual event with you uh, for Harvard um, Bookstore discussing your book. And, yeah. and, we discussed- and we're all buddies, you know, we got our PhDs together. We had the same advisor. We studied the same thing. We both kind of branched out, but, um, but you know, we, we started in the same place. That's awesome. We loved her book as well. Um, we discussed with her the green look at the effect of certain algorithms in people's lives, uh, from judges using rule-based ad ranking systems to justify convictions to predatory loan ads targeting vulnerable communities. Um, back in 2017, um, you retweeted a screenshot, which I thought it was um, it was interesting. Um, it was of Google Translate, which transposed the values she and he when asked to translate she's a babysitter he's um, sorry, he's a, he's a babysitter and she's a doctor to Turkish and back to English. And, and you mentioned on your tweet that the real problem isn't the algorithm, but the number of people who say the algorithm is, is, doing, is doing the obviously correct thing. So do you think in general algorithms mirror, reinforce, or even amplify human biases? And how, can, how do you think uh, data scientists and uh, people behind these algorithms can account for these gaps? I mean, I think they definitely can amplify and reinforce human biases like if you choose to (laughs) use them that way i mean like it's like you know does a drill like go through a human skull like i guess it would if that's what you chose to do with it i mean you got to be careful (laughs) like if you're if you're careful the drill is probably not going to go into your skull or your hand it's going to go into the wall where you mean to put it and where it can do some good so i mean i you know i mean this is obviously kathy's book weapons of math destruction goes more deeply into this issue than mine does. So by the way, another great book, and you should have her on, is Meredith Broussard's book, Artificial and Intelligence, which is another book on this theme uh, that does super interesting stuff. Um, but you know, one thing I write about in the book is this uh, algorithm called word to vec a system uh, made by uh, Google Labs, which renders every word in the English language as a 300 dimensional vector. And if that sounds like hard to visualize, um, it is, but you can also mean like a list of 300 numbers. That's another way to think of it. So it's some kind of numerical encoding um, of a word. And I think when this came out, people were like, wow, like that's it. We solved the English language. Okay, we've sort of developed like meaning space and we sort of know like its meaning is encoded in those 300 numbers. Like, no way. It's like both more and less than that. But certainly what it's encoding because it's basically just something that, it, that Google learned from their sort of some huge database of text that it has. I think this particular one is trained on like Google News. So sort of somehow some incredibly large corpus of news articles. Um, it's like some kind of record of how people use words. So an example, uh, you can sort of see very clearly that if you sort of say, if you give it a problem like, okay, take the word stunning and um, and modify it to be like by the word she, so that you're putting in a female context, uh, you get out gorgeous. Okay, so what, is, what does that say? Does that say that in some sense, like the meaning of the word gorgeous is that it's the female version of stunning? Like, no, I mean, those are just two words that don't have any genderedness to them, except insofar as the way people who write in English actually use them. So I think I think the algorithm is great. And I think it's a cool piece of work. And I love to play with it. And it's super fun. And it was Google very kindly has made all the embeddings available. So you can just like I did, like download them onto your laptop and sort of, you know, with a few lines of Python sort of start playing it with yourself, which is like, I highly recommend. Um, but you see that it's not a map of the English language. It's a map of people who write in the newspapers use of the English language, which is a very different thing. 
right? And as you say, whatever biases we, we have and whatever words we may have like a habit consciously or unconsciously of associating with other words, that's going to show up and the algorithm is going to say, those two words are close. So this notion of closeness, this is a great place to go, actually, because in some sense, one of the overarching themes of the book is like, how do you know when you're doing geometry? What do all these things have to do with each other that are not about like protractors and right ruler encompass constructions, right? It's this fundamental idea that there's a notion of distance, a notion of which things are close and which things are far apart. Any context in which you think that way, I would say, let's face it, I have a pretty Catholic idea of the term, I would say is... Um, means you're thinking geometrically. So you would say like, okay, it's a, it's a geometry of words in order to say like which words are close together and which are far apart. And I think as long as you understand what that really is telling you, it's not telling you something intrinsic about the meaning of the words. It's just telling you that English speakers have a habit of using those words in similar contexts. And what you are learning about is not the words, but the corpus of existing text. Um, I think it's fine. I think you just, well, I mean, maybe fine is too strong, but it requires a certain amount of vigilance. Look, I thought of a good example. I know I never stop when I'm talking, sorry, but like, I'll say one thing and then I'll give you guys a pause. It would be not accounting for that stuff and ignoring it and just saying like, the data is what it is. Like, sorry, if there's bias in it, there's bias in it, what can I do? This would be like, if you were to like study, if you were to sort of like grind up some novels into vectors in this way. And then you'd say like, I've noticed that American novelists are like really into numbers and like use a lot of numbers in their prose. Like, what does that mean? Like, why, do, why are they so fond of like using numbers in their prose? And then you find out, oh, the person who encoded the text, they didn't take out the page numbers. There was like a page number at the bottom of every page. And that was just included as like a word used by the author. And like, I, I guess you could just say like, well, they were in there. So therefore I discovered that people love numbers. Or you could say, hey, like maybe you could actually recognize that that's sort of some separate phenomenon that is, doesn't have to do with the text of the book. And maybe you could like clean your data a little bit and take that out first. And I think most people would say like, yeah, obviously that's what you should do. You shouldn't have this like attitude that it's like a sin to, me to mess with the data if there's something in it that you know is not what you're trying to capture. There was a there was a book that made me think of um, a book that I read that I um, read by Janelle Shane where she was trying to see whether they were trying to teach an AI how to recognize certain things on a picture, and they inadvertently taught the the AI how to recognize rulers which they were using to, to uh, right next to it as a measuring uh, as a, as, a, as, a, as a way to measure the, the what was being uh, pictured. And I love this stuff because you know look what's the here's the difference between a mathematician and an engineer, which you are right because. An engineer is trying to make things work, which is a very valuable thing to want to do. And I admire it. Uh, but mathematicians, we're more interested in like how things are and what's going on. So these algorithms for me, you know, for the engineer, they're like, I want to see like when it can work as well as possible to carry out a certain task to get a prediction right. I like it when it gets the prediction wrong. Because I'm like, that's how I'm going to learn how it actually works. So I, I'm interested in when it fails because that's when you see something interesting. Well, let, let's let's actually do that, and let's let's take a step back and talk about about math and and, ge and geometry in general. And one aspect that I found fascinating, by the way, uh, was when you referred to Sir Ronald Ross, uh, the Nobel Prize win uh, winner, famous for discovering um, in um, 1897 the female mosquitoes transmitted malaria, uh, when he laid out the theory of random walk, and in his particular case was applied to random flights uh, flights of mosquitoes carrying the disease. However. Uh, this geometric theory branched out to a bunch of other applications in finance, computer science, physics, psychology, and among other disciplines. And I, and, and I don't think that this is an outlier. Uh, many other theories have found applications in other fields. So do you think math serves as a framework for so many different areas in sciences and engineering? And what are the, and as a follow-up would be like, what are the most active areas of research um, in geometry today? Yeah, so I mean, I definitely think that's true. You know, there's this famous phrase, which I think is Eugene Wigner's phrase, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Like, why, like, why is it that sort of some, if something is mathematically interesting, it turns out to be applicable? We still don't know, but it happens again and again. And in the case of, um, of Ronald Ross and the mosquitoes, it's actually even better than that. I mean, there's lots of cases where somebody comes up with a great mathematical formalism, and then people seeing it are like, oh, wow, I could use this for this thing and this thing and this thing. In this case, it's actually all the more startling because this mathematical formalism was being discovered independently 
all around the world by people who are doing different problems somehow in some kind of, I don't want to get mystical or anything here, guys, but like in some kind of psychical sense, the world was ready. Like between 1900 and 19, 1905, the world was ready for the idea of the random walk. And so, you know, Ronald Ross and Carl Pearson and Laura Rayleigh discover it. But at the same time, as you said, like this kind of early mathematical finance guy, Louis Bachelier, I mean, the field is mathematical finance then. So I don't know if it makes sense. He was, he was in that field before, like 50 years before it existed. He is discovering it, studying stock prices. Einstein is discovering it, studying Brownian motion. Uh, and Markov in Russia is discovering it from a pure math point of view in order to solve a theological argument, strangely enough. And none of them know about each other because there's no internet, right? They don't speak the same language. I mean, this math, the spread of math was much slower in those days. So um, yeah, I found that to be like an absolutely fascinating intellectual story. How can it be that this kind of same idea when the world is ready, just flowers, in many different minds, in many different places. And it was decades before they all knew about each other, actually. Um, you asked, though, you took it a different way. I said the thing I wanted to say, but you asked, like, you know, today, what's going on in geometry? And like, boy, so much. And like a lot of it, we don't know yet how or whether it will ever apply to something outside the realms of pure math. Maybe just to throw out something, there's like a super interesting program, which I'm anything but expert in, called Homotopy Type Theory and Univail and Foundations, um, where there's a philosophy of saying, you know, we chose a long time ago, thanks to, you know, our boy Alan Turing, that our model for computation was going to be a digital one. The fundamental unit was going to be the bit and operations on the bit, right? Like zeros and ones, and we carry out logical operations on them, and we can model all of computation on those kind of digital processes. Um, so some people are saying like, well, what if we were just wrong? No, okay, what does wrong or right mean? There's no truth about, our, we choose what models. Maybe a better way to say it is, what if we could have done it a better way? What if we could have done it a better way from the beginning? And what if sort of like more geometric, more geometric operations were actually the right way to set up our model of computation all along. So this is like pretty out there, like wild stuff, but there are a lot of adherents. There was a whole sort of gaggle of people kind of like huddled at the Institute for Advanced Study a few years back, sort of like working through this. And it's, um, you know, I mean, one of the good things about mathematicians is that we are always trying to ask, like, what if things were other than they are? Right. What what if we just do this a different way? And because we're mathematicians, like nobody can stop us. Right. We don't need to find that thing in an experimental <laughs> thing. I mean, if we can imagine it, we can write papers about it and prove theorems about it. So you mentioned earlier um, that uh, many scientists at the same time made similar discoveries. And uh, you also mentioned the book uh, Stigler's Law of Eponymy where uh, a scientific discovery is getting named not by the original person that discovered, which I found very fascinating. Which is your favorite uh, example of uh, Stigler's law? Well, of course, a very famous example of Stigler's law is Stigler's law, because it was really formulated, actually, as he <laughs> pointed out, by a sociologist uh, who came earlier. It's funny, I would say in that area, actually, it's a little bit non-Stigler in that I think um, the two terms we most use, I mean, we use random walk, which is Carl Pearson's formulation, but we also say Markov chain. So I don't know if that comes up in your guys' work in finance, but I can promise you that like lots of people in finance talk about Markov chains all the time. And I actually do think that of those people, the person who did the most to not just solve a particular problem, but like really establish a sort of the mathematical foundation in the theory was Markov. So I think maybe this is that rare case where like the right person gets the credit. Yeah, because I because I'm, were very familiar with uh, Markov and I was impressed about the story behind it. And also of the way of doing the different syllables and trying to see how its Russian novel was programmed, let's say. I also, this is a little bit embarrassing, but I also learned that, uh, you know, a sort of very critical modern way of setting up a Markov process is called the Metropolis algorithm. I always thought, so this is like my Greek culture. I always thought that that was like, it was invented in some city or something, but no, it's like a guy, Nick Metropolis. <laughs> <laughs> so my whole life, I assumed that. So I was a little embarrassed that I did not know that was a person, Nick Metropolis. <laughs> like this, I mean, a Greek Well, it sounds guy. a bit like where Superman's from. Ex exactly, exactly. <laughs> 
Uh, so also during the reading about different mathematicians in the book, I couldn't help but notice that many of those were aspiring poets. And do you have the poetry journey yourself? I mean, I was more of a fiction guy. I definitely aspired to like write novels. I wrote a few poems, all novelists do. Uh, they are safely guarded from history. Um, but it's funny, you know, this thing was not something I planned to write about. And it, like so much else in the book, it was something that as I was researching, it just kept coming up again and again until I realized like, well, I had to kind of put it, I had to sort of center it and really talk about it because it is weird. like how many of these, you know, how many poets were like really interested in and in, in mathematics and like how many mathematicians were like really interested in poetry and involved with it. It just kept on coming up. And, you know, as a writer, sometimes you, you're like, okay, the research is trying to tell me something. You know what I mean? If this comes up and up, like some, something is telling me this is like supposed to go in the book, like as a real, um, as a real strand. I mean, you know, maybe most notably because of this poem I found early on, this poem by Rita Dove, who used to be the poet laureate of the United States called Geometry. I mean, who knew there would be like, you know, I thought maybe I would sort of use it as an epigram or something or sort of put it in it. But then I, the more I re read and reread the poem, the more I like, I realized that this poem was basically where I wanted to end the book. Like it was sort of saying all the things I wanted to say, of course, much more poetically than I can say it, but then I'm... It was really, it was really, really interesting. And uh, in a sense, poetry and music have a kind of geometry behind, right? So it's very interesting to think yeah. that they managed to connect those two things. And maybe this speaks to like my personal interest because like every, it's almost a cliche by now, this relationship between mathematics and classical music and the sort of mathematical structure of classical music. But unfortunately for me, I don't know anything about classical music. I don't really understand it. And I don't know how to appreciate it. I mean, it sounds nice to me, but there's a certain level of like actual ability to engage with it that I don't happen to have. Whereas poetry, I basically get, you know, I mean, I've read a lot of poems. Like I sort of know, I, I know how they work in my gut in a way that I could not tell you like what a symphony is doing, right? I can just be like, sounds nice. Like he's sawing away like that big wooden thing like it sounds good okay that's i mean that's my level of interaction with it so um whereas with the poems exactly I, feel like I can see it i can take it apart and like really interact with it so as we're approaching uh, the end of our session since this is a uh, books over drinks i would love to ask you do you have a drink of choice and uh, perhaps what kind of drink would you recommend for someone uh, reading your book perhaps a wisconsin beer I do. Oh, I think as an employee of the state of Wisconsin, I'm supposed to mention a Wisconsin beer. And indeed, just after we finish, I am going to go out and drink some Wisconsin beers with Perfect. some people on our campus. But if I'm to be honest, if I'm to be honest, my favorite drink uh, is a G&T, a gin and tonic. Uh, I had one last night, my first of the summer, actually, but the weather was perfect for it. The weather, there's only certain times of year you can really credibly drink this drink. And yesterday was, I think, absolutely perfect gin and tonic weather uh, in Wisconsin. And maybe I, it, is, it is a coincidence and not related to my love for this drink uh, that you can't spell geometry without g and <laughs> I love it. I will take it. <laughs> All right. So the book is called Shape, the Hidden Geometry of Information, Biology, Strategy, Democracy, and Everything Else. It is by Jordan Ellenberg. We'll share a link to his bio so you can learn more about him and his work. Uh, Jordan, it was a pleasure having you, um, and we look forward to having you back. By the way, cheers. Cheers. This is really fun. Thank you, guys. Cheers.